That's all right. I think I'm good. Morning. Good morning. Well, I wonder if everybody else is looking for the invite. I didn't realize until after you resent it that uh, you had sent both on the 8th. We did get more than usual this time. Uh, I think it was because they were sent earlier than this week. That might have been why people either missed it or forgot about it. Uh, um, I did, get, I did get a few emails this morning, but uh, uh, and I will keep track of that if anyone else needs one. Uh, thanks for your note, Bob. Uh, I think that's okay. Uh, maybe we'll be done by eleven thirty. <laughs> it's the first time for everything. I can I can hope. Yeah, yeah. If we're done, that would be great. And I'll be in uh, St. Thomas for the next meeting, 
uh, I'm assuming that everything's fine with the internet. We're just an hour ahead of Cleveland. Right. No, an hour. Yeah, an hour ahead. So it'll actually be ten o'clock for me. So you can you can join us from the pool anyway. Yeah, yeah. Join us from the pool or yeah. the beach. <laughs> All right, but yeah, I, I should be there. Okay, great.
Hello? Carl? Yes? Hi. Um, Andrew Arusi from Dollar um, had a short delay this morning. He had some trouble at home with his uh, child getting him out. We're wondering if, if Franklin could be put instead of first, if that's possible. Uh, when, when that comes up, I'm sure the chair will ask that. We'll have that come up when that. That's okay. not a problem. We can move things around. Okay, perfect. Yeah, he'd like to be here if he can. He'll be, he said, five to ten minutes late. Okay, I don't think it'll be. Okay. A, we still, we have two items actually in front of you, so you're, you're technically the third, so it'll probably. Oh, be. okay. Yeah, it probably shouldn't be a problem then. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Julie? You seem to be cutting in and out. Good and morning. I can't hear you right now. We know. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> we, we have a quorum, although some members had problems with the link this morning, so uh, I resent it. Yeah, I had some issues with the link initially, but um, I'm sure they'll get in just like me. Okay, good. And just a reminder, we we don't need a quorum to start the public hearing. Um, but uh, when you're ready, you can read the preamble and then we can uh, call them call the hearing to order. OK, uh, well, there uh, are a few people with a time restriction. We could we can begin with the preamble. Right. Um, welcome everyone to the October 28th Landmarks Commission meeting. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law in section 101.021 of the Codified Ordinance of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the City Planning Department conduct their meetings according to Robert's Rules of Order. Actions during this meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you keep your microphone muted and use the raised hand uh, feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raised hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile versions and activated by clicking the hand icon. 
Please wait for the chair or the facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon again and muting your microphone. We will be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activities are being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email have been considered. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. We'd like to begin today by calling um, our public hearing to order. Um, I'd like to ask staff to summarize the history and significance of the property. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to remind the commission that we are holding this public hearing today according to Chapter 161.04 of the Landmarks Ordinance. We are not taking action today. Uh, we're only here to take testimony. Uh, any action will be taken at the next meeting. Uh, the property, the the uh, the uh, Norfolk Southern Bridge over Lake Avenue was nominated by the commission on July 8th, of 2021. Uh, we determined that it met seven of our 10 criteria for landmark designation, including its eligibility for the National Register of Historic Places, that it exemplifies the cultural, economic, social, or historic heritage of the city, that it's identified with the work of a master architect, and that it embodies elements of architectural design, detail, materials, or craftsmanship, which represent a significant architectural innovation. Uh, we sent a letter to the owner on August 17th, uh, seeking consent. Uh, that was also resent on September 2nd. We received a response from the owner of the property, Norfolk Southern, declining the nomination on September 24th. Uh, we we sent them a letter notifying them of the public hearing today on October 4th, and a public notice was published in the Plain Dealer and on Cleveland.com on October 23rd. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Julie, I think you're muted. Uh, we can't hear you. Thank you. I was muted. <laughs> um, we'd like to now open the floor uh, for um, public te uh, testimony for those or from those who are speaking on behalf of the nomination. So, as yeah, I think Don said it, this is not going to be uh, this is a public hearing only to hear people uh, who either are for or against this nomination. There will not be a vote taken today. So um, I'd like to open up the floor for anyone who'd like to speak on behalf of the nomination. If you are here to speak on behalf, if you could use the raised hand function so that we can um, acknowledge you and you know, allow you to speak. Um, Ms. Spencer, uh, Councilman Spencer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would like to speak, but I would first like to yield. I know there are a couple of others who prepared a presentation. I would like them to provide testimony first, if that's okay, and then I would appreciate an opportunity to speak. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Wazell. Oh, he's, he's. Mr. Wazell, are you are for or against? We are against. Yeah, I just uh, raised my hand for the appropriate time. Yeah, I, I would. I think Ms. Hudson has been trying to raise her hand, but it keeps going up and down. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Wazell, if you don't mind until we transition to people that are against the nomination, uh, we would appreciate it. So, we can move on to Ms. Uh, Hudson. Yeah, sorry. I was having a little trouble figuring out if my hand was up or down. Um, so, I just I wanted to add a couple things um, about the history of the of the bridge. Um, you might have seen from the photos that before the Lake Avenue Bridge was constructed, 
1912, dangerous tunnels um, occupied the site until a neighborhood uproar convinced the city and the railroad to build something more suitable for the entrance to Edgewater Park. And uh, in 2018, we came full circle, a group of neighbors, we call ourselves the Friends of Lake Avenue Bridge, we began holding cleanups and advocating for the railroad to make necessary repairs to the bridge, including correcting its failing drainage system and preventing concrete from falling um, from up above onto those passing beneath the bridge. Um, you know, the bridge is eligible for, for as um, Mr. Pettit mentioned, for, for many reasons, including its architectural significance um, and the importance of, of Frederick Striebinger, the architect who, who designed it. Um, it's also important because it is a, it is a testament to a key period in the early, early 20th century in the city of Cleveland. There was a, a great collaboration between city engineers and railroads in order to replace a number of grade crossings uh, around the city. And this is, this is one of those crossings. It wasn't a grade crossing, but that collaboration was key to the uh, cast iron encasement. Um, that is what makes up the historical um, components of the bridge. Uh, the, uh, the railroad agreed that since this was at the entrance to the city park, that the additional expense was warranted, while um, you know some place that uh, wasn't in such a significant location might not uh, warrant the same um, expenditure for decoration. Um, unfortunately, this part of the story has not come full circle uh, because instead of collaborating with the city in order to make these necessary repairs. The railroad is instead choosing to allow its property to deteriorate in the public realm. In this case, directly between my neighborhood and one of the region's most important assets, Edgewater Park. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Is that at the end of your presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I it's it. Um, just want to make sure that I wasn't moving on before you were complete. Um, are there other people here to speak on behalf of the nomination before we transition to Ms. Spencer? Ms. Laplacchia? Yeah, I can just um, chime in to um, second everything Nikki said. Uh, she and I helped write the uh, Cleveland Landmark nomination together. Um, and this really is a, a wonderful architectural asset in Cleveland, one of several of Stribinger's works that are still extant in the city. Um, and it really is remarkable in that it kind of checks all of the boxes for historical significance, be it the architect, the still beautiful architectural elements, and then also um, its importance to this moment of um, cultural kind of Beaux art flourishing of architecture and collaboration between people working on Cleveland's infrastructure from both the private and public sector. So uh, anyway, I would just want to reiterate everything she said, and I'm happy to answer more questions about the history should they come up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaPlacchia. Um, Ms. Uh, Councilman Spencer, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would like to thank Julia LaPlaca and Nikki Hudson for providing testimony today when this bridge was was first introduced for local landmark status. There was a really compelling presentation and this is the, the next step after that initial process. And I uh, goes without saying that there is historic significance to this to this bridge. I would like to make some comments as follows. The city of Cleveland has every right to landmark this structure. We can and we should do so. 
beyond the historic merits of the bridge itself, of the, of the very structure, which you have heard about, and about its concerning and dangerous state of disrepair, which amounts to demolition by neglect by Norfolk Southern. I do also want to note the importance of surrounding historic context and how Norfolk Southern's negligence is taking away from what others, what we as a community are trying to accomplish. The public sector has been doing its part to improve our neighborhoods, improve Edgewater Park, and it is time for Norfolk Southern to step up and accept its responsibility in preserving this historic structure at this point in time. So I'd like to share a little bit about the important context here. As Ms. H Ms. Hudson mentioned, this has always been a historic gateway to Edgewater Park. It remains so to this day. So Edgewater Park, for those who, who might not be local here in Cleveland, is absolutely the crown jewel of not only our city, but our region. You have significant pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular traffic that passes under this bridge daily to reach Edgewater Park. This is a gateway to both to Edgewater Park and to uh, a, a residential neighborhood and the Gordon Square Arts District. So you're bookended on one side by Edgewater Park, by historic Edgewater Park, and on the other side, the primary basis of the success of the entire surrounding area is rooted in, in historic preservation. Most notably, the only reason that the Gordon Square Arts District has been successful is because of its historic fabric that is, has avoided demolition after careful community stewardship. So this is the missing piece in the puzzle. So I think, I think that the, the argument has been set forth and carefully made about why this structure on its merits, regardless of its location, is deserving of historic preservation and landmark status. But I think when you embed that in the surrounding context, it is, it is, incred it is much more, even more compelling. So I will conclude with a couple of comments about how the public sector has been doing everything within its power to invest in the surrounding area and, and preserve this part of Cleveland. So as many of you know, the Ohio Department of Transportation invested $95 million in the Lakefront West uh, and Cleveland Lakefront Bikeway, which transformed the shoreway into a boulevard. This is literally steps away from this bridge, a $95 million investment in 2013. The Gordon Square Arts District is a $30 million investment in and counting. City of Cleveland's Clifton Boulevard improvements in 2016 were a $49 million investment, again, to, uh, to make that a boulevard and to add transit enhancements and really increase the historic character of Clifton Boulevard. Cleveland Metro Parks has invested $8.5 million in Edgewater Park and counting. The Lake Avenue bridge improvements themselves, my predecessor on, on Cleveland City Council, Councilman Matt Zone, did everything he could on the parts of the property that are not owned by Norfolk Southern, including the wing walls, to paint them, add landscaping, add drainage, to add lighting, which has been completely deteriorated because of um, runoff, mud and moisture runoff from underneath the bridge, the lack of moisture barrier that continues to make the pedestrian experience going under the bridge very, very dangerous, very slick surface um, because of um, the the structure of the bridge and the drainage system is not where it needs to be. It is not intact and not safe. That was $150,000 that my predecessor allocated towards the bridge. And we have an active project underway as we speak, which is the City of Cleveland Lake Avenue improvements that literally go underneath this bridge, including um, new pedestrian and bicycle amenities, new medians, planter beds. That's a $3.6 million investment. So all told, we're talking about over $200 million in public investment in the immediate area. So much of it rooted in the historic character and the pride we take in this being the gateway to Edgewater Park 
and the gateway to the Cadell neighborhood and the Gordon Square Arts District. This is the missing piece. The city of Cleveland does not have jurisdiction directly over Norfolk Southern's property. We have been corresponding with Norfolk Southern for years. We have asked them to uh, improve and stabilize this bridge. And we must use this leverage that we have. The city has a right to preserve this historic structure. If it is not landmarked, then what, will, what has been happening to date will continue, which is that Norfolk Southern will um, address safety concerns on the bridge by literally peeling away the historic elements. And, and it's a slow process of demolition of neglect of this historic structure. So that is what has been happening to date. And I, I beseech and I implore the Cleveland, the city of Cleveland Landmarks to Commission to protect, protect this structure and to protect all of the surrounding investment and care going into our historic neighborhoods by landmarking this bridge. Thank you, Councilman Spencer. Are there others that are here to speak on behalf of the nomination? Okay, um, not seeing anyone else uh, using the raise hand function to speak on behalf. Um, I will transition or we will transition to uh, public testimony for those opposed to the nomination. Mr. Wazell. Yes, ma'am. Thank you uh, uh, very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I, I do have to tell you that Cleveland will always be near and dear to my heart. I spent a lot of time there with my son who had a uh, brain tumor. And so we spent a lot of time there in Cleveland Clinic and uh, the people there are great. The, uh, the hospital is great. And uh, like I said, Cleveland will always have a spot in my heart. Um, I have to say Norfolk Southern understands and appreciates that uh, the Cleveland Landmark Commission has selected the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern Railroad Bridge over Lake Avenue for potential designation as a Cleveland Landmark because of its importance to the heritage of the community. NS would not be opposed to this designation if it, if it weren't associated with review oversight permitting requirements of the commission. These are actions that we feel would interfere with Norfolk Southern's inspection, maintenance, and repair of its bridge. Lastly, what I must say is the designation itself does not cause concern for us um, as we feel uh, the, the oversight and the permitting are preempted by federal law. And that's the end of my statements. Thank you, Mr. Wazell. Are there others uh, who are here to speak opposed to the nomination? Uh, Ms. Kersey? Oh, I'm sorry, your hand went up and down. Did I cut your name? A did I pr pronounce it correctly? Or I apologize, you Madam Chair. That was a mistake on my part. Okay. Um, it went up and down very quickly. So uh, are there others here to, that are opposed to the nomination? Okay, not seeing anyone else use the raise hand function to be opposed. We will adjourn and close the public um, hearing for today. And we will move on to our uh, land. We'd like to call the, the Landmarks Commission uh, meeting to order. Mr. Pettit, could you please call roll call? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Here. Ms. Bailey. Here. Mr. Bonazzi. Here. Mr. Kalikia. Here. Director Collier. Mr. Dreyer. Councilman Jones. Mr. Santora. Here. Mr. Strickland. Here. Mr. Tarasic. Here. Ms. Trot. Here. And Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. We'll begin um, with our uh, public hearing action. Um, 
related to the Slovenian workers' home and World War II uh, war monument. Would staff like to tell us about this project? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we we held a public hearing uh, two weeks ago on October 14th, and it was requested that we have a meeting with the ownership and the councilman and the CDC to talk about the the, the designation. Uh, that meeting happened, uh, I think, late last week. Uh, we've met with the owner. We met with his uh, representative from uh, Hanna Real Estate. Uh, we also met with Peggy Kersey from the Development Corporation, Councilman Polensic, uh, and we talked about all the elements of the des designation and how it might impact the property. Uh, I think it was very productive. I think we've uh, we've we made some progress. Uh, uh, staff has agreed to separate out the war memorial from the designation. Uh, uh, we think we're confident that the ownership and the councilman will find a solution for that monument uh, in the neighborhood in a better setting, uh, probably in, in Veterans Memorial Park, which is not, not far away from the site. Uh, we've also We've also restricted the designation to the single parcel that the building sits on. Uh, I, I think I think I think the ownership is much more amenable to the designation now. I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, but uh, uh, it seems like we've 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 come to to some level of agreement. Uh, there are still some issues uh, with the building and the tenant, but. Uh, I, I think we've we've made some progress, and and I'll, I'll let I'll let the ownership talk, uh, and 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 supplement everything I just said. Thank you. Thank you. Does someone like to speak on um, on behalf of ownership? Hi, Patrick Hawkins. I'm sorry, I don't have that hands up function available on my screen, so I have to do this the old fashioned way. Um, is my audio clear? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would agree with uh, staff's comment. We had a very productive meeting a week ago last Thursday to discuss um, the designation. Um, again, I would reiterate that my intent uh, with the property was always one of uh, preservation and uh, to, uh, to be able to honor the history of the building and display that. Um, I think staff also have I've shown some of the artifacts we've kept um, in the building itself. Um, so uh, we are enthusiastic about moving forward to the designation for the hall. Um, the memorial, again, um, we feel we have a solution. Um, I've got a veterans group that looks like they would be um, eager for this to be um, donated into their care to remove it from the parking lot, which is really, we don't feel it's an appropriate spot for it. And uh, the potential to move it to Veterans Park and in the neighborhood would be just, I think, a, a wonderful win-win for the entire project. So um, that said, again, we would be enthusiastic about moving forward to get the hall designated as a landmark and uh, and continue with the original intention, which is to uh, preserve and, and restore that facility and then uh, get the war memorial into an appropriate spot in the neighborhood. That's all. Excellent. Thank you for that um, feedback, Mr. Hawkins. We appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Kersey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, again, I was at the meeting as per Don Pettit and uh, the CDC stands in support of being able to uh, take the monument out and just do the Slovenian workers home parcel at this time. We will continue to work with Mr. Hawkins around concerns that he has um, other concerns that he has about the building and the other parcels um, and we will work with uh, himself 
uh, any uh, party that we can through veterans organizations. One of the veterans on my staff right now is looking at other uh, uh, ways to help facilitate get this monument moved to Veterans Park or another similar situation uh, because where it is right now does not um, really does not showcase it nor is it beneficial for the monument in the middle of a parking lot where it's used as a bumper stop for cars. Uh, so we stand in, in uh, support of all of this work and we'll continue to work with the city and uh, Mr. Hawkins on this as we move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that feedback, uh, Ms. Kersey. Uh, Mr. Brunges. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna point out just for clarification, what would be designated. You can see here at the center, We've removed this parcel here. It would be sublots one through six. So one, two, three, four, five, and six is now what would be the designated parcel, which would eliminate this, which is now parking lot as well. Thank you for that clarification. That was helpful. I was going to ask that question. Other uh, people to speak on behalf of the nomination. Then I will open the floor to the commission for questions and comments, and then we will be making a recommendation on this. Correct, uh, Don? Uh, that's, that's correct. We will be voting either to proceed or not with the designation. Perfect. Okay. So I'd like to open the floor for the commission for questions and comments. Questions and comments from the commission. I will begin. I think this is a, you know, an, um, obviously by the outcry of the uh, the community and the feedback from the CDC and the ownership. Um, I'm very happy that you know this, there is support for this facility and the monument, and um, appreciate everyone's time to you know, meet offline uh, to really get alignment for you know, the future uh, success of this property and the monument. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to add that I really do commend the owner of this property. He explained <clears throat> in the last meeting the hardships that he's encountered since purchasing this property, but he has continued to uh, hang in there and, and support the uh, rehabilitation of this structure to maintain its historic character. And uh, so I just wanted to comment on the appreciation that I have for this property owner in uh, continuing to invest in this beautiful historic building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Pettit. Madam Chair, I just wanted to add that that uh, although no one's here from the council office, I just wanted to point out that Councilman Polensic is still in support of the designation. Thank you for uh, clarifying that and adding that. Other questions or comments from the commission? Uh, if there are no other questions or comments from the commission, would there uh, would someone like to make a recommendation for nomination? And to continue the process. Mr. Strickland. Yeah, I will uh, make the motion to nominate this parcel and this uh, structure for landmark status. Thank and, you that. and I'll for, second it. Okay, thank you for the um, the motion and the second for clarification, Mr. Strickland. Um, are you aligned with the um, what Mr. Pettit outlined for uh, the details of the parcels, the building, on and the monument being separate? So, are they separate nominations, Don? Just for clarification, or are these a singular nomination? This is. At at this at this point in time, this is one nomination for the for the hall and the building on on the one parcel. We will address the uh, monument 
uh, separately at a later time when it's when it's more appropriate. I would also point out that we've already nominated the building as a landmark. Today's motion is to proceed with the designation and and to prepare prepare legislation. All right. So Thank I you. amend my motion uh, not to nominate the structure, but to advance in the process to uh, present the council for approval as a landmark. Uh, right. And that just this structure and the parcels associated with this structure, not including any other parcels or the war memorial. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Amendment. Second. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Any further uh, discussion? Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Benezzi. Yes. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank you for the commitment of the ownership and the CDC related to this property. We'll move now move on to the certificates of appropriateness. We'll begin with our first applicant located at Franklin Yards Cook um, Bousfield House at 3105 Franklin Boulevard. The applicant will use the raise hand function and open up your mic, announce yourself, and tell us about your pro um, project. Yeah, hi, Andrew Irusi from the Daly Group. Um, not sure how to use the raise hand function, but uh, hopefully you can hear me, see me. Um, so this is uh, 3105 Franklin Boulevard, what we're calling Franklin Yards um, at the moment. Uh, the uh, I believe this is the third time um, I've been in front of uh, the Landmarks Commission for this project. First time was in uh, late 2019 when we were seeking approvals for demolition of non-historic uh, building additions that had been added over time. Uh, those have those have been taken down. Um, we were here most recently uh, a couple weeks, uh, maybe a couple months ago, uh, for a preliminary approval. So. We're back with uh, a little more information and and seeking final approvals today. Uh, I've got Jeff Gibbon from Gibbon Architecture here with me uh, to assist in in uh, feeding you guys some of the design details. But um, as a refresher, this this property sits um, between 31st and 32nd on the south side of Franklin. Uh, it is a property that was purchased. Um, in uh, the early 1900s by the YWCA. At that point, there were two mansions, uh, the Cook Booze Field, which you see in the, the forefront of this rendering, and then a, a second mansion that they tore down about 10 years later to build two buildings that, that served as dormitories. Um, so uh, the Y was there, and then, sorry, then there's additional fourth building in the back. You can kind of see it uh, in the uh, bottom right corner of the rendering. It's a a metal shed building that was built as a recreation space. The Y was here, um, I think into the 50s, and then there was an organization of nuns that that uh, inhabited the property for some time, and then it became a family medical care facility in the 70s, um, and that's when they made uh, over uh, you know the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, a series of additions connecting the buildings. There was a corridor that was connecting the entry that you see in the, the um, uh, the front dormitory with the gable roof there um, that wrapped around and connected to the front of the mansion. There was a connector between the mansion and the, the red building, and then they also came in and added the elevator tower and connector between the two buildings that sit on 31st Street. Um, so we sought approval again to take down um, the majority of those connections that were made, the one along Franklin and the one between the mansion and the, and the rec building in the back. We left the elevator connector, which will serve as our main entry to the property. Um, I'll point out one thing that changed here with this rendering uh, subtle, but um, we had talked about uh, a color scheme of trim and finishes uh, for windows and and um, 
architectural elements on the building that was more of a, a, a gray brown kind of color. So you'll see that that difference, the, the rendering has been updated to reflect that. And there's um, some material color swatches that uh, give a little more um, of a picture of what that is. We haven't made a selection on which manufacturer we will use for the windows. They will be exact historic replicas. Um, and we've got some details in the set that's, that uh, speak to that, show you um, existing profiles and then uh, profiles that will be used to match. Um, so we don't have a, uh, an actual color code, but we know that they, all of the manufacturers offer something in this, um, in this basic, basic color that we've selected. Um, so if we can move to the, the site plan. Uh, so this is the existing survey. Uh, again, that connector was taken down there. Um, we peeled off the connection from the mansion to the red building. Um, in the process, also exposed a historic um, porch element that had been enclosed and was, I think, serving as a pantry and a kitchen. Um, so that'll be um, uh, renovated, reinstated, and, and exposed on uh, the interior face of the courtyard. Um, but if you continue to scroll through, um, Gosh, I should have it open. I don't know which page. Uh, so yeah, there's there's an aerial again um, showing the connection that was taken down. There's some existing uh, or more recent existing photos of of the building. You can kind of see in the bottom left there. That's the porch that I mentioned uh, that had been enclosed in a corridor that's now um, fronting the uh, the interior courtyard space. Um, some more progress photos. Uh, we've, if you continue to scroll, we did add some historic uh, images that we had um, sourced. Here you go. Uh, that was a request I think that was made in the last meeting. So you got one picture um, of the uh, the dorm building shortly after they were built um, on 31st Street, and then on the right side of the page, two different eras of uh, the mansions. The lower being an older photo where you can still see the uh, the um, adjacent property. Uh, before the the dorms were built and the house that was there, and then a later photo of it uh, above. Um, if you continue to scroll through, I'm trying to get to the, the <coughs> plan. So here's the material um, kind of general um, palettes that we're at. We, we were asked to add. I mean, a lot of the building again is existing um, condition, so existing brick that will be. Um, you know, cleaned and repointed and um, uh, but then some of the new materials, the trims, that's the the kind of the, the window and trim color there on the left. And then uh, a sample of the uh, kind of shingle looking asphalt roof that will be used both at the, the front dorm building um, and then for the replacement of the roof on on the cook booth. Um, so, yeah, if you can continue to scroll through just. Some details here of, of uh, existing and, and new doors. Um, here's the windows. So you can see there's uh, existing window types. Um, we were able to use the uh, the windows that were that remained in the basement that were original windows to match the profiles for the proposed window types uh, that you see below there. Um, Continuing to scroll, these, so these are the uh, uh, windows in in the mansion. Um, those were a little more uh, simple, I guess. Window profiles, one over ones. Um, so we'll be uh, matching those as well. Um, with um, it'll be a, a an aluminum extrusion historic replica window. So that's the the demo diagram again. I think I covered that. Um, if you keep scrolling through at some point, we should get to proposed. So these are all just existing condition documentations. This is very much, by the way, the set that we submitted to um, SHPO for our historic tax credit approvals that we received. Um, so here we go. That's the uh, current proposed development site plan. Um, this this shows landscaping, which actually at the end of the set has now been specified in terms of plant materials. Uh, this also shows uh, existing trees, um, which I think are better identified on the next page. Um, yeah, so 
I believe the notes call out existing trees, which are essentially um, the the four, um, oh, all the ones that are colored here. I think that's how we're we're identifying it. So. Yeah, the green uh, trees are existing, and the the one orange tree is an existing tree that we need to remove, um, just because that's where all of the services are will be coming into the building, into the apartment building. Correct. Um. The lighting plan, uh, we've, we've shown uh, signage as well. There's an elevation of um, of a, a retaining wall that'll have our signage element on it, I think towards the end, is that right, Jeff? Correct, yeah. Um, existing floor plans, sections of the building. Um, I'll note here, uh, this reminds me, uh, last week we received approval from historic design review. There was one condition in that they wanted us to come back with a little more information on um, the, that uh, front porch that will be built um, again in front of the, the, the mansion there. You can see an elevation of it kind of in the center of this page. Um, we have some detail that we're showing here, but I think there was a little more desire to see um, some dimensions and, and some more close up uh, um, section cuts and stuff like that. So we're working on that and, and planning to go back uh, um, in the near future to to present that. Um, just more elevations of the bill. Oh, here you go. There's the the signage wall, kind of in the middle of this page here. Um, so two locations, right, Jeff? That we're showing it. You want to? Um, sure. Um, the two locations where we're putting signage, um, and, and I think the signage for this project is more subtle. Um, the in the top left is the a blown up elevation of the east elevation, which is along West Thirty First, um, just to the right. Um, this is in the connector between the two historic apartment buildings. Correct. That's right. Um, and we are adding, so that's across the street from the parking lot where we are um, providing most of the parking for the building. Um, and so we're creating a new entrance for the project there. Um, so that that will be, we imagine, the, the entrance that's most used by tenants who are driving, coming and going. Um, so we're putting signage there on um, brick walls. That brick will, will, we will, we haven't selected the brick yet, but just for that new brick, to match the uh, brick of the connector building behind it. Um, and then below that, in the sort of the center left of the page, is a freestanding landscape wall that appears in the landscape plan. Um, it has some pathway lighting integrated into it and then um, pin mounted metal signage on the north side of it that would be visible from the sidewalk and from Franklin. And then I believe the next page is the landscape plan. That's where I was getting to. There you go. There. So yeah, as Jeff mentioned, uh, we also, um, with this property, acquired the lot there at uh, 31st and Franklin on the uh, southeast corner. Um, it backs up to the roads property. So that is going to continue to serve as our parking lot for the project. Um, we are adding uh, a nice landscape buffer all along West 31st Street that wraps Franklin um, with some uh, some some decorative metal fence um, and uh, and masonry brick piers um, that will also I think have a, a couple light poles on them. Um, is that right, Jeff? Do we if we shown two poles that have to be added here? I think he's buffering. He might be frozen there. Yeah. We kind of went back and forth between adding light or trying to work off existing street poles. We're kind of assuming just based on what we've observed that there's a little uh, uh, additional light that'll be needed. So keeping it minimal, but using something, um, you know, just to, to meet basic code requirements for light spread. So I think that's 
pretty much uh, uh, covers most of it, can certainly answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we'll move on to feedback from the local committee. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, this is Donna Gregonis with Ohio City Incorporated Neighborhood Development Director. Um, so Dallas Group did present to the local design review committee and this was approved um, with some conditions unanimously. So the conditions were to come back with further details for the porch and fencing. Um, I know those were two really important details um, that they'd like to review in the future, but um, they seemed excited about this project and it was approved as presented. So looking forward to seeing it come to life or back to life, I guess. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, are there any other people um, from the city to speak on behalf of the project? I don't see any others. Okay, then we will open up the floor for the commission for questions and comments. Uh, Ms. Bailey. Um, again, um, this is a beautiful project you're working on and restoring this um, existing um, building. Um, I just only have a few questions uh, related to the low walls um, and, and that's the decision of the um, owner. I see that you're not using any fencing, so um, you're leaving the property open. So that's um, a nice gesture. But on the low walls, um, what type of material is it? Because I noticed when you were doing the signage, um, you have brick um, wall with um, like a white type of coping on top of it. Is that the same material along with third and, and Franklin? If you can go to some of the photographs, I couldn't tell what type of Unless those are existing and you're not doing anything with it, just want to know what type of material those are. Yeah, so um, I'll let Jeff uh, chime in too. I think if he's if he's connected here, but um, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I lost my connection for a second. Apologies. So I think I think the new walls, right, Jeff? We were we're thinking we would be a brick again to match existing brick with yeah stone coping. Uh, there is an existing wall along retaining wall along west 32nd street that our plan is if it's structurally sound which we're still assessing basically just to to do any kind of um, repairs that might be needed and restore that wall maybe even uh, refinish it we've talked about looking at you know a, a brick veneer on it but um, if it's in good condition and and we can you know make the concrete look attractive we would probably just use it and leave it as is and put a, a nice decorative fence on it so um, I, I will clarify. So we are showing a fence. Um, if you zoomed in on the plan, you'd kind of see a couple gate uh, door looking elements at the wa the walks coming in there. So as Donna mentioned, that was the second thing that design review uh, conditioned. So in addition to the front porch, they wanted to see uh, more detail on the fence we want to use. So historically, the property did always have a fence there. We plan to use something very much that has an ornamental wrought iron decorative metal look to it um, that that runs across um, Franklin Boulevard and, and ties into that retaining wall. All right, thank you. And yeah. then um, one more question. Um, I didn't hear in your presentation, um, do the site with the landscape, would it be some furniture um, on the um, site, the landscape area around the site? I need to hear that. Yeah, so we haven't selected furniture, but we'll definitely, um, you know, one of the things that drew us to this property, we, we like to put a big uh, green space element um, incorporated into all of our projects. So here, this obviously sets up really nicely with the internal courtyard. Um, we haven't gotten to the point of, of um, selecting furniture yet, but within that um, internal space that will, you know, really be for the use of the, the residents at the property, there will definitely be some furniture and kind of um, in some of the patios that you can kind of see carved out. Um, if that's what you're asking. Um, well, tip, if this is you asking us to approve the light landscape, um, if 
if you are having uh, some furniture, um, normally we see it with the landscape um, work along, if it's within the space, if it's not on the building, and if it's on the landscape, it's usually with it. So that's why I asked that question. Gotcha, okay. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. But that's all my comment, thank you. And those are for more fixed furnishings versus loose furnishings uh, often too, though. Um, Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to start by commending both the applicant and the uh, architect for this just like very in-depth and beautiful presentation. I know last time we had um, comments that we brought up about the landscaping and like the thoroughness of and the beautiful landscape presentation that you brought forward is just truly amazing. And, and I just want to like commend the fact that even in designing the landscape, you kept in mind the like original like architectural intent of the building and the kind of like the matching of the new landscape design with the historic um, existing structure. I think all of it just really blends. And just um, I wish more people would take the level of care that it seems that you are taking. I think that's a more of a personal statement of mine than on behalf of, you know, our commission. But um, I'm just very excited for this project to see how it goes forward from every detail just seems to be considered and how it relates back to this beautiful existing historic building that we have in this community. Um, I think it's a really, really, really well done project. So thank, thank you. you for sharing thank this you. with our city. And yeah, thanks very much. And thanks. that's all. Go ahead. Anything else, Mr. Bonazzi? No, that's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Santora? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to echo the sentiments of Mr. Bonazzi. Um, I think this is a great project, really well done. Uh, my only comment would be if we can go to the site plan of that shows the parking lot. I see that you're enlarging the curb cut onto Franklin. Did you guys explore or look at alternatives to remove that curb cut off of Franklin and move it to 32nd place? I know you would end up losing one or two spots, um, but I really think it would be helpful to maintain that edge along Franklin uh, and buffer out the parking if you could get that curb cut off of there. Um, yeah, so, uh... I think we did take a quick look at it. It it does. I can't. Maybe Jeff. I don't know if you remember exactly how many spaces we lost, but we definitely lose spaces. Um, I believe know, it was. Not, go ahead. Th yeah. Sorry. I believe no, it was no. um, three total. Okay. Possibly four. Um, and I, I'll just I'll jump in really quickly. The reason for widening. The curb cut um, is because we wanted to provide double loaded parking um, and the the curb cut where it currently is is offset to the east side of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would not align with the drive aisle in that parking area there. Okay. So could you guys absorb the loss of those parking spaces to move it or is the amount of parking that you have uh, contingent on moving the the building forward. Um, so, so we're from a code standpoint, I think we could absorb the loss of parking. Um, as a developer in Cleveland, um, our experience shows that um, you know one per one uh, code is is sometimes not quite enough. Um, so we try to basically get to to one per bed, um, and I think you know we we'd be we, we wouldn't feel comfortable um really with with less parking so i think that's why we ultimately decided to to leave it where it was and to utilize the existing curb cut um we've tried to minimize any parking in the interior court you can see we do have a few spaces there and those are really um meant to be uh, uh the ada access spaces um and uh, plus like one or two others um, out of convenience. But uh, so we'd probably, if we if we didn't have the option of using Franklin, we'd probably feel like we needed to find a way to um, to try and create more internal spaces. Um, again, just, just based on our experience as a, a property manager and operator, um, we feel like we'd end up, you know, with tenants who'd be parking on the street, so. 
Okay, no, that's understandable. And I wouldn't want you guys to expand the parking inside the courtyard. I think you guys have done a fantastic job in there with the landscaping. So thanks. Um, I I can live with it. I'd still like to see it move, but uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push it too hard. I think it's a great project. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Santora. Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I also agree. I think this is a great project. Um, it's nice to see this coming together. Um, I am just curious. This is not really germane to what we're voting on, but um, when the Franklin Lofts was renovated from the old YMCA, uh, the developer was able to incorporate a lot of uh, interior original historic features, whether it be woodwork, strapwork ceilings, um, they even uncovered a brick fireplace mantle under drywall, which they incorporated into their um, their designs. I'm just curious if you were able to find any original um, moldings, trims, fireplace mantles, built-ins that you were able to incorporate into your design. Just just out of curiosity. Sure. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, so the the dormitory buildings, I think, were built uh, a little more economically. Um, you know, so there there wasn't a lot of interior features um, that were decorative or ornamental. Uh, there's some existing, um, you know, kind of doors uh, that we're talking about refurbishing in, in um, you know, certain areas of that building. But it was pretty much um, kind of hard lid, you know, plastered square boxed rooms. Um, the mansion, however, certainly does have a lot of decorative, really ornamental uh, trims, uh, crown moldings. Um, um trying to think of uh Jeff the elements that are kind of in the center of the room that are round shaped and really decorative that we've the, uh, the pendants that um yeah. used to hold the lighting fixtures in the ceiling. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The medallions. That's yeah, the medallions. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um so yeah, we've been working on getting molds made of those so that we can um we can match and, and restore all of them. Um and, and as well as so there's some, some doors in that uh, house that are are large, you know, round arch doors that we're restoring and reusing. So great to hear. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Other questions or comments from the commission? I will give my comments. I think I um, there's nothing. I think the rest of the commission has said everything that I wanted to say. I think this is a great project. I uh, commend you for the the care that you're taking of the facility and you know the landscape to align it with the the original intent and use of the property. So I think it's a great project, and I'm in support of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions or comments from the commission, or would someone like to put forward a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay, Ms. Bailey. Um, I make a motion to um, approve um, the design as presented. I don't. I didn't hear any stipulation or anything like that. Agreed. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, Mr. Brunges has a his hand up. Before we move on to a second, I'll I'll wait for a second. Because okay. there's a motion. Uh, I'll second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. For, uh, further conversation. Go ahead, Mr. Brunges. I believe there was some further details on that front porch that still needed to be hashed out um, by the local committee. And I don't know if the commission wants to have those returned as well. Um, what were the other conditions from the committee, Ms. Gregonis? Um, the conditions were. Good morning again. Um, the conditions were they would like the um, design team to come back with further details of the porches and the fence. If they could please come back with those details, um, that was uh, their motion was contingent on that. Thank you uh, for that reminder. So, um, I I will invite um, the motion is to um, to put, uh, approve the um, uh, presentation at. Um, the motion is to approve the design as presented with the um, stipulation to come back um, 
is this okay to the commission if, if it can go to staff or to, um, to review the porch and um, the fence um, for staff review? And if they feel it needs to come to the commission, then it can come to commission that way. I feel comfortable with them returning to staff for the, the porch, the details of the porch and the fence detailing uh, to return to staff. That's the motion. Okay. Ms. Anderson, do you second that with those conditions? I second that as amended. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion. We have a second for the conversation. Mr. Brunches, your hand was still up. Was there further clarification? Yeah, I'll just, uh, since the local committee asked for it to be reviewed by them, we'll ask them to review it and then we can approve it administratively after that. I think that would be fair since that perfect. was the request. Okay, perfect. Any further conversation? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Calicchia. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We look forward to your project moving forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll move on to our second applicant located at 1730 West 25th Street, um, 2810 Clinton Avenue, 2459 Washington Avenue, and 4909 Lorraine Avenue. It is the Matthew 25 collection sculpture installation. I'd like to um, welcome the applicant. Please. Uh, Use raise hand function, open your mic, announce yourself, and tell us about your project. Hi, good morning. This is Greg Peckham with Land Studio. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Maria um, Estes from the Community West Foundation to take the lead on this. Um, they are the um, primary organization who is leading this, and our staff is helping them um, to kind of project manage the work and, and get it done. But this is a Community West project. I'd like them to introduce it. Welcome. Um. Well, I see that Maria is there. Um, but in the interest maybe of uh, keeping the the. Sorry, mute. I was oh, muted. <laughs> okay. I was talking. I'm like la la la. Sorry, muted. Guilty. Um, thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Estes. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director with Community West Foundation. Um, as Greg said, this is our artwork project that we present to you. And um, before I we dive into the specifics of the sculptures, I just want to give you a brief overview of Community West Foundation. Next slide, please. Our mission is to advance the health and well-being of our community. And um, we do this in many different ways, but the primary way that we support the community is through grant making. And so our grant making is fo focused on basic needs. So anything from providing food or shelter, clothing, medical care, that is where um, the core of our work is. Um, we are also connected with Fairview and Lutheran hospitals. Um, we were actually the Fairview, Fairview Lutheran Hospital Foundation before we came community became Community West Foundation um, I, over 20 years ago, but we're still very connected with them and we support them in grant making and event fundraising, other projects and things like that. Um, another way in which we uh, support the community is through uh, philanthropic support. So uh, for other nonprofits, we house their agency funds, their endowments. We also help individuals through donor advised fund support, um, annuities, other um, planned giving efforts. We look to the book of Matthew in the Bible to help guide our grant making. 
Um, so the areas called out it in that um, Bible passage are areas in which we look to the nonprofits that we serve um, in their service to the community. And that's how we decide where, well, one of the ways in which we decide how to make our grant funding. So providing shelter to the homeless, eliminating uh, food insecurity, um, access to clean water, supporting refugees, um, all healthcare aspects, including addiction recovery, and then helping those who are formerly in prison. In, 2000, in 2020, um, Community West invested in over 70 nonprofit organizations, and it was our largest year in history of grant making. Um, 7.4 million was given out in grants. The geography in which we serve includes Cleveland, Western Cuyahoga, and Lorain County. Um, we give large grants, like our largest grant goes to the Cleveland Food Bank, uh, but we also support smaller organizations like church food pantries and Meals on Wheels in Rocky River. So um, next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about how this began. Um, Community West purchased a replica statue of homeless Jesus um, several years ago. And so um, the artist that created the sculpture series that you're about to learn about, um, his most famed piece is Homeless Jesus. And it exists in over 100 cities in the United States and other cities across the world. And our foundation, because we're so focused on helping the homeless, we purchased this replica as a visual representation of helping the least of our brothers and sisters. And the purpose was to travel it around to um, different churches, different grantees, and just raise awareness um, about this and raise funds. And so it's been going around town since 2018. And then in the fall of last year, St. Barnabas and Bay Village received the statue for their period of time. And within 20 minutes of it arriving to the site, someone called the police on a homeless person that was sleeping on a bench um, in their neighborhood. And the priest at St. Barnabas tweeted about it, and within days, it went viral. Um, we had national and international media outlets reaching out to us, um, asking about this, the, how the police had been called on this statue and what that represented in terms of, um, you know, the conversation around social justice. And it was very, it was a whirlwind. It was exciting. And it, it, the statue did exactly what it was intended to do. It was intended to spark the conversation around helping people in need and not turning a blind eye. And it certainly achieved that. Um, we saw a dialogue about white privilege, um, empathy, compassion. Um, and so after this happened, we kind of took a step back from the flurry and said, wow, look at the impact that this made with this one instance. Um, what if we built upon this? And so um, in talking to the artist studio, we learned that there was in fact a collection of sculptures called the Matthew 25 collection. And with Matthew 25 being our guiding principles, we were struck by this artwork and um, we really felt it was um, something we wanted to do. It's a visual re representation of what we do and let's further that conversation in the community and explore acquiring them. And so we went to our board, they responded, we raised the money, um, we enlisted Land Studio to help us with the project. They're the experts in terms of um, the artwork and the installation um, parts of this. Next slide. So the goals of this project are to elevate awareness and stimulate dialogue around um, social justice issues, truly human rights. Highlight partner organizations that are impacting social justice issues. So you'll learn more about where we, we intend to install these sculptures and um, they're all connected to the Community West Foundation. Um, and we just want to beautify and enhance the community with um, this artwork and the powerful message that it gives. Um, these are 
life-size statues and so they're they're very compelling to experience in person and truly the installation of these is only the beginning we have um, so many ideas and um, just really activation around the artwork where we want to have a tour we want to invite the artist here we want to have um, outreach to schools and to churches to come and experience these once they're installed. So we, we see really great opportunity around the project. Next slide. So just a little bit about the artist, Timothy Schmals. He's, um, he's Canadian out of Toronto. Um, he's worked, he has artworks all across the world. Um, I mentioned the homeless Jesus being his most famed piece. Um, he actually just commissioned a piece uh, for the Pope that was installed in September. Um, and one significant thing to point out is that once these are installed in Cleveland, we will be only the second city in the world next to Rome, Italy to host the collection. So that's pretty exciting and significant in terms of um, putting Cleveland on the map again, because we're, we're great anyway, but. Um, and next slide. And now, Greg, I'll turn it over to you if you want to talk about the locations and all the pieces yeah, and parts. Yeah, sure. That's, yeah, perfect. Um, I'll be brief, and uh, Nancy Boylan from our staff, who's been running this project, will, will kind of uh, close us out with the specifics of each location. But as Maria was saying, um, the Community West Foundation supports over 70 organizations across the region. Um, so there was no shortage of potential places for these to go. Um, so when we started um, matching the sort of themes of each of the artworks with their potential grantees, um, we really kind of had a matrix and we, we had a couple um, important decision making criteria. Um, one was we wanted these to be, um, I think this uh, committee commission knows well the importance of maintenance um, and sustainability. Um, so we wanted these pieces to be um, have a home at places where they had the resources um, and capacity to um, care for these pieces long term. Um, we also thought that a, a bit of a critical mass was important um, that um, if these were um, clustered somewhat uh, close together that people could um, you know, take take a stroll, take a walk to to experience uh, them and to, to check them out. So, the footprint that we're going to share with you is um, is fairly tight. Um, we shared this with um, the um, Ohio City Design Review a few weeks ago. Um, they were enthusiastic about the location. So, um, Nancy will walk you through each one of these. But those are some of the ideas that we wanted to you know, kind of critical mass clustering of these, and also you know, really the importance of. Mary matching the theme of the artwork with the mission of the organization that it will be connected with and their ability to care for the uh, for the pieces long term. Um, so I'll be quiet and let Nancy take over and then we can have questions. I'm sure. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. The community partners that um, we worked with, you know, both Maria and myself met with them on site to determine the specific location as to where, um, you know, each of these sculptures will go. You know, they will be maintaining them. They will be hosting that, you know, the sculpture. So um, we felt as though it made sense for obviously for them to be the ones to to kind of cite where the, each of these would go. Um, so homeless Jesus, uh, this will be installed at St. Malachi Parish, and it'll be kind of like out in the front of the um, of the church in front of their sign on their, I guess, out on their patio area. Next one. When I was a stranger, this will be on the um, campus of Urban Community School. Um, it will be located close to uh, the refu refugee response home, um, and it'll be at the corner, I think that is um, West 47th and Lorraine Court. Next. When I was sick, this is at Lutheran Hospital. It will be on the, I believe it's the southwest corner of Vestry and West 25th Street. Again, you can, I tried my best. I can't do much of Photoshop. So there's a red line there, um, kind of just kind of showing you where uh, Homeless Jesus will be installed. Next. When I was naked, this one will be located at Malachi House. Um, you can see the two uh, references as to where it will be placed. It'll be 
on their private property up against um, kind of tucked up against their the the building itself. Next. This one is when I was in prison. This one actually is already installed. And this is at the Family Ministry Center at on Fulton Road. Um, one of the things that I'd like to show um, also with this picture um, is the sign, the signage that will be um, installed at every location. You can see the actual physical sign on the, the bottom almost center area, and then the actual physical sign in the photo um, to the right of the sculpture. It'll have that QR code so that visitors will be able to, um, you know, determine like they'll use their phone and they'll be able to gather information um, about the sculpture and about the project. Next. So when I was hungry and thirsty, so this one already has been installed. Um, this will round out the sculpture, the six uh, sculptures that are in the collection. And this one is currently at Old Stone Church. Next, I believe that is it. Yeah, so this is just, uh, <laughs> you can go to the, the next slide, but this is just, I mean, the, the project has been doing, I think, exactly what Community West had, had hoped for about sort of um, elevating dialogue about social justice issues, using the artwork as a um, kind of a springboard and a platform. Um, for um, talking about about those types of things, so it's really very closely tied to their mission and the idea that um, these public artworks can be a part of, um, you know, kind of raising that awareness um, and making sure that you know we as a community are thinking about the importance of those issues. So we will stop there and take any questions. Uh, thanks for everybody's time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we'll begin with uh, feedback from the local committee. Good morning again, Madam Chair and members of the commission, Donna Gregonis with Ohio City Incorporated and Tremont West Development Corporation. Um, so the local design review committee did review all of the sites um, that are in that are being discussed tonight or today. Um, I did have one question for the design team. Did this did the placement of the statue at 2810 Clinton get moved since it was reviewed? Okay, so um, this was approved as presented um, with the exception of 28, the placement of 2810 Clinton. Um, and the only concern they had was the original presentation that was given by um, <clears throat> the team. It was in the public right of way. And I think there were some questions surrounding that, but ultimately they approved it. So I think now that it seems to be on private property, I'm sure they wouldn't have any problems with that either from what I know about them, um, but this was approved unanimously aside from that one. Um, so everyone was excited about it and we can't wait to walk and see all of the sites in person when they're here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we will um, continue on from feedback from the councilman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate you having me on this morning and allowing me to um, speak to the commission. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for this art installation. Uh, thank Community Westland Studio and all the partners who participated in this. Um, as most on this call know, the near west side, including, of course, Old Stone Church, um, have a long history of social justice and serving folks in our community uh, who may be unhoused um, or seeking out assistance in one way or another. Um, so we, you know, I feel and I believe I can speak on behalf of the community that, you know, um, this art installation reflects the decades long values of the community. Um, and, you know, will be welcomed here as a way to continue the conversation. That's how we promote uh, social justice and how we, um, you know, are a welcoming community for everybody and Madam Chair, um, you know, whether it be. Uh, homeless services or, you know, LGBT rights or otherwise, uh, our community prides itself on being one that is open and welcoming uh, to people uh, of all backgrounds. So uh, we welcome uh, these art installations. And I, again, want to thank all of the partners for uh, making this a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, we'll move on to feedback from staff, Mr. Pettit. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out that the commission has already approved the installation at Old Stone Church. Uh, and only four of the five proposed today are in historic districts. Uh, the fourth one or the fifth one on, on Fulton Road will have to be reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission. And uh, Tara Petrus is also with us on the phone, and I think she'd like to, to contribute some comments. Thank you, Don. Um, this is Tara Petrus, the uh, public art coordinator with the city of Cleveland. I'm also in support of this project. I think um, it's nice to see a series of sculptures being added to the public art landscape, especially with the themes behind Matthew 25. And I believe those particular elements were drawn from the 44th verse in that chapter. Um, and thank you, Don, for mentioning that 3389 Fulton will go to Planning Commission on November 4th. I was going to mention that, but I think um, this is very well done um, as, as a series of sculptures. Um, and I'm fully in support and I look forward to the additional installations with this project. Thank you. I would like to. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Petrus. Mr. Pettit, we'll now open the floor for questions and comments from the commission. Um, Ms. Bailey, you can go first, and Giancarlo, you can go after that, since I heard you, but I don't see your hand. <laughs> um, these are beautiful um, artworks, and I really appreciate you bringing attention um, to the social justice, especially the homeless. Um, beautiful artwork. Uh, could you go to the one in Cleveland Clinic? Um, location. I just have a question for that one. Um, so obviously the Cleveland Clinic sign is going to stay there. So the sculpture is going to be in front of it. So how is it going to affect the sign is of Cleveland Clinic information? That is correct. Um, so we were on site uh, with the staff from the Cleveland Clinic, and um, so there the the height of the um it's only 39 inches tall um so it will not obstruct any of the uh signage uh that relates to the cleveland clinic thank you for that and another question i have if we can go to the signage that you said it's going to be for all the sculptures um I, i'm i'm not in favor of the uh, qr code and what is that reference? Is this just giving you history about the sculpture in the program, or what is it for? So it, you have it the labels to give, that the science gives the description about the sculpture. So what's the purpose of the code? Oh, it takes the you to code. the QR code takes you to our website, and there it'll link you to more content about the artwork collection. So say you stumble across when I was in prison. And the sign says one of five sculpt or one of six sculptures. You can then access our website to learn about those other sculptures, where they're located, and then continue on if you want to see the rest. Um, is it proportional wise? Is it possible you can make it smaller? Um, you know, with a phone still tap into it. It's kind of large in sign, taken away, you know. It draws my attention to it <laughs> before I can yes. start reading, um, you know, the, the text. So uh, if it can it get smaller and you can still be able to tap your phone on it. I will have to look at the technology, but I don't see why not. We can look into okay. that. Okay. Well, another option is, um, I, I understand that um, that's just one option, but if, 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 if that won't work and maybe have some attachment on the side with your information and people can just grab it out. You know, I know it rains and snow and all that, and I understand that's what you're looking at. I'm just wondering if it's something um, I have, like in real estate um, or various, they have like flip pops. You can put information inside and protect from the rain and um, you can have your information that way. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, and it can protect your information if you decide to use some type of uh, card or without putting that code on the sign. So that 
that's what I'm just looking at. Those two things that you can investigate, but that that code is kind of too. The sign is beautiful if that's what we're improving on or we're looking at the a boat on, but that code is, is is too large for it. And then the next um, comment I have is the timeline. Uh, again, I like the concept of what your organization doing. Uh, is each sculpture is going to stay there permanently, or are you looking at rotating at other locations that would have interest in putting it on their um, property? Um, these are actually going to be permanent installations. Um, we have yeah. MOUs with each of the sites. Um, the only way in which we would um, move them is if the organization where they currently are, um, if they they leave that location or they change their mission or something drastic to that effect, but that's all covered in the MOU, but we intend for them to um, stay where they're at indefinitely. All right, well, thank you. Great job and continue with the um, good effort. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Um, I personally think the QR code is a, a good way to, to um, since everyone has gotten used to using QR codes for, to access material in, you know, since post COVID, I think it's in, um, a great way to maintain that information there and up to date and relevant versus you know, paper personally. But I do agree, maybe the proportion could uh, be smaller. So it's less uh, of a focal point and allowed your, um, your logo and the information to be the dominant part of the sign. Um, but that's my personal opinion there. Uh, Giancarlo, I believe you're next, even though Thank you um, see your hand. I just want to comment on what a wonderful project this is. I'm really uh, pleased that we're using permanent materials, granite, marble, and bronze, which are classical and everlasting, which is, I think, um, a great addition to Cleveland. Um, and to our appreciation of art in general as a community. Um, I, I think my only comment is regarding that code, which is a little, maybe excessively large, and I'm not sure because so many um, the artists and the people involved in the project have websites and other ways of, uh, for people to contact them if they need any additional information or, or knowledge. So I'm not sure that that code is really necessary, but the project in general is amazing. I love bronze. It's one of the greatest, probably the interest technology of human history. So it's just wonderful to see these permanent, lasting pieces of work, art in, in Cleveland. And I thank you so much for doing it. So I'll, I'll just uh, jump in on the thank you for that um of course especially coming from you we know that that's uh those are important um elements of this this project um in terms of the qr code we you know we'll take a look at that if there's one thing that's you know probably the easiest of this entire thing to to um you know to get to adjust that's it so we're happy to look into that and if um you know if we downsize it you know kind of make it more proportional we'll do that um you know we do think it is important um, because most people will probably experience these as a one, you know, kind of they'll, they'll come into contact with one. So we really like the idea of having, giving them the opportunity to understand that it is part of a bigger um, collection of, of pieces. So that's, you know, kind of the motivator behind that. Um, but we will certainly look at, you know, getting it sized appropriately so it still functions, but isn't such a dominant um, feature to the, to the signs going forward. Thank you, Craig. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Giancarlo. Mr. Teresic? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, add my support to this as well. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful project. Uh, these sculptures are very, very moving uh, and, and love how they are being distributed uh, around our community and, and placed in, in wonderful places around our community. Um, the, the one question, and I agree with the QR codes as well. The one question I have, though, is, is um, I could see uh, individuals uh, seeing the, these these sculptures, and whether they're they're other organizations or individuals themselves finding them quite moving themselves, and and, and uh, questioning whether is it, there's an opportunity uh, to purchase a, a smaller replica of a bronze type statue like like this, uh, and then perhaps using those proceeds for other social justice 
uh, endeavors as well. Has that, there been any thought to that as well? Because I think that that might be an opportunity, but I just think the project itself and where the locations are are just, just very phenomenal and very, 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 very moving. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trasic. Ms. Anderson? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was walking downtown a few weeks ago and I happened upon uh, the uh, when I was hungry uh, statue in front of the Old Stone Church and I found it very powerful, very moving. Um, I, you know, the message is, is very, you know, very thoughtful and very gripping. Um, but I think part of the reason that it was so powerful is the outstanding execution of the the sculpture and the uh, uh the sk skillful rendering of the uh, the forms there so i uh, totally applaud this um th these installations i think they're going to be a wonderful permanent addition to our environment here and i i think that the um sculpture was very fitting for the um beautiful historic old stone church uh, just a just a beautiful piece of art um i uh i also think that probably we should keep the qr code you know if we can minimalize it a little bit that'd be great uh these days in real estate we really don't use those flyers they created a lot of litter they weren't very green and most people want to look at look things up online uh, so I, I think that the um, QR code does detract a little bit from the plaque, but uh, it is useful. Um, it's a great way to convey the message. So uh, thank you very much for bringing this to our city. I, I really, um, really applaud this. Thank you. Thank you. I just Mr. just um, dropped into the. Uh into the chat, there's a link to the small replicas that are available. Um, and so it is something that uh, Community West has has definitely thought of um, as a sort of, you know, a way to sort of perpetuate um, the project. So you can, you can take a look there at, at that link whenever you have time and uh, see what those look like. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, since we've gone through on uh, everyone's comments on uh, Mr. McCormick, or I'm sorry, Councilman McCormick, I see your hand still up. Did you have additional comments before I continue on? Nope, just forgot to lower it. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I only had one comment about the QR code because I weirdly have had a project before where I had to get a QR code made into a sign. Um, and as long as there is enough contrast they were able to do it in the same bronze material when i did this project like two years ago um it was just a question because i know in this one it's a black and white kind of like applique sticker instead of being like a part of the sign i i don't know if that's something you want to look into in case like the code ever has to change in the weird event that the link gets broken or something like that um but i do know that it can be done where it's like a part of the material instead of like kind of an image that's attached to the um, bronze sign. So that's just something to consider whoever is making your signs just to bring up and see if they can do that. Um, that was awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. We, we did not look into that as, as an option. So we will see if the um, fabricator that we're, we've been working with has that capacity. Fabulous. That was my only comment. Otherwise, I'm excited to see them. Thank you, Mr. Benazzi. Um, Ms. Bailey, do you have additional questions or comments? I like that idea with the comment about the color. See if you can, uh, I like that. <laughs> um, um, after this project is finished and it's permanent, is, are you looking at in the future finding other location or is this the end of it? Um, so this will be the end of the installation of the collection, the permanent collection, but we will have activations around it. So we want to put out the map of where they're located and have scheduled tours for people to go and see them all in one visit. We're gonna have the artist come here and have him give a talk on how he created and how he was inspired to make these. So there, there will be ways in which we further the conversation and keep 
people interested in the artwork, but we don't foresee additional pieces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Um, I didn't actually give my full comments before, but I, I think you know I echo everything that has been said and asked. And um, as I mentioned, I well start off. I, I do really support this project. I think it's a wonderful community addition um, and education of you know the issues uh, you know at hand that we we do need to talk more and bring more visibility to. So I think this is a great um, project, and the locations are. Um, in very thoughtful related to each organization. Um, so I'm in support, you know, of the project and I was going to mention the same thing. Mr. Bonesi did is yeah, just if it can't be, uh, if the QR code cannot be, you know, reduced and or incorporated into the sign itself, just, um, changing the contrast. So it looks more, um, like a element of the sign versus an added addition to the sign. Other questions or comments from the commission, or would someone like to put forward a motion? I put forward a motion that um, that is approved as presented. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Could could we add the barcode as part of the motion? Well, I think we do need to give the applicants some time to do their due diligence of how oh, to okay. reduce the uh, right. recommendation to reduce the QR code size. I think you can do that as a con uh, condition. Okay, that's fine. I agree. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yeah. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Well, this is a very exciting um, project and what's your timeline for installation? Well, we hope to get them all installed before the end of the year, but they are delayed due to the global shipping. Um, backlog yeah. due to the pandemic, so we're hopeful, but we're realistic as well. Okay. Well, we look forward to the installations. Beautiful project. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. We're going to move on to our fourth applicant located at 11150 East Boulevard Fine Arts Garden Extension. We'd like to welcome the applicant. Please, uh, you're welcome to open up your mic, announce yourself, and tell us about your project. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Jeffrey Strain. I'm here today representing the Cleveland Museum of Art and also the Fine Arts Garden Commission. And today we are presenting a, uh, a, a project in a, on a site that is, um, uh, it, it's actually a piece of the fine arts garden. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little further. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the site is actually across the street from the fine arts garden, um, but, but that was something that happened kind of at the beginning of the planning of the fine arts garden. So um, next, and the museum has been maintaining it as part of the garden since its inception in, in, in 1928 or incorporation in 1928. Um, and here is a, a view of the plan from the Olmsted uh, Brothers firm showing the complete site before it was segmented, but there's a dotted line with a, with the showing the proposed Chester Avenue cut. Next slide. Here is a, here's a, 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 an image of the Olmsted Brothers plan after that street had been um uh, planned and 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 uh implemented and you can see it still remained part of the fine arts garden planning and thought process um even after it was separated um uh, from the from the terminus of the garden and it was something that the olmstead brothers embraced they said this is a, actually a better configuration for our plan 
uh, a more symmetrical terminus to the garden. Next slide, please. So the uh, Northeast Ohio Sewer District has been installing infrastructure. I'm sure you all know, have heard about it um, in an effort to mitigate flooding in the University Circle area. Um, and the um, as part of their project, this was this was a there was a line item in their planning uh, of about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars to rehabilitate the property once their infrastructure had been uh, installed. Um, and then when it when it came to our attention, um, we agreed to take the take that piece of that project after their infrastructure work was done. Um, and, and and make a more enhanced plan, something that was more in keeping with uh, the quality of the work that we've been trying to do in the Fine Arts Garden as part of our as part of the, the um, landscape master plan of the art museum. Next slide. So here's you know this is just a slide showing the the um, the, the infrastructure on the right, uh, the portion of the, that plot that is dedicated to to infrastructure um, and you'll see some more details of this to see how it would it actually appear. Next slide. <clears throat> so there was a, an effort, there, there are several um, comprehensive master plans in operation here. What, the Sasaki and Associates had done one for the university, which was, which was pretty large in scope. Um, and then the museum hired Sasaki as well to knit together all of the various um, uh, pieces of, of uh, land that surround the art museum, including the Fine Arts Garden, and to create a comprehensive rehabilitation plan for it. And it has been partially implemented, uh, though we're still looking ahead to, to, to future improvements. And then there was a, um, a comprehensive look once this site became a, a focus and, and, and uh, perhaps an opportunity to do something a little bit bigger um, Sasaki was engaged by both uh, UCI and the Art Museum to look at the Art Museum to look at this little parcel and for and to UCI to look at the, the larger what is currently the David Davis Garden uh, to see if that, that could be um, improved in terms of its use and, and its connectivity. Next point, next slide. Here is a view of that comprehensive look. We're only today um, looking at the art museum's portion of it, which is a uh, fine arts garden. And you can see there's a kind of a, um, we treated this as an opportunity to, to, to do a couple of things. Uh, one, to open up a vista towards the fine arts garden, uh, so that to make that connection a little bit clearer. Um, and two, to reinforce the uh, university circle, the memory of the university circle, the trolley turnaround. Uh, the the, the uh, Commemorative sculptures on on the, that and the other and the adjacent sites um, are all looking towards the center of that circle. So um, uh, this plan hopefully makes the you know reinforces the memory of the old circle and makes sense out of the commemorative sculptures that are all looking towards what was the center of of that trolley turnaround. Next slide. So here is a, the original concept plan. Uh, we priced that plan and it was uh, kind of beyond our, our, our means. UCI has been working with us uh, to raise the funds for this project. We've taken it from the 230 that is, was originally uh, slated uh, by the sewer district for the rehabilitation of the, type, of, of the site. And we have now over $800,000 budget um, you know, that we've raised towards uh, Im improvements of the site. So it had to be reduced in scope and that is on the right. And then there's a rendering in the next slide. Um, I'm here today with uh, Ivan uh, Valentik and he will take it from here, I believe. He is a, a, an architect with uh, GPD who is working with Gil Bain, who is the construction manager for the project. Ivan. Yep. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I'll just walk you through. This is our, I, I guess, most updated and current plan. You know, we've we've collected a lot of information um, in in ground truth, the initial master plan, and and what we've kind of um, got. What we where we're at today is really is very very close to that initial concept that was developed. We've also worked closely with the sewer district uh, to understand their needs and how we incorporate 
that infrastructure and blend it into a, a, a nice uh, a holistic solution for the site. So I'll, I'll kind of start, you can see um, MLK to the top of the page, uh, Chester Avenue to the, to the left, and then Euclid Avenue at the bottom. And if we start from the top, um, what we've really done with this project from the north is really is uh, opening up the, that corner there to start to accept people um, coming coming across from the fine arts garden. And we've one of the changes you'll see in this plan is that we've also now incorporated a sidewalk along MLK, so that'll allow for people to come across there as well. And if you come across, you can see the um, sewer district area. All of their infrastructure, not all, most of their infrastructure is actually going to be below ground. And what you'll see at grade are a couple manhole lids um, and really electrical control panel is all that you'll see above grade. The, um, we've coordinated with the district and the, the surface for the vehicles to enter the site because they will need to enter. They will enter from MLK and they will exit on Euclid Avenue. But when they enter, they are going to enter on a reinforced grass turf surface. So our goal here is for this to look like just an open lawn area. However, we do need to define the edge of that reinforced turf with um, flush, you know, concrete curbing so that vehicles do know where they can drive and they can't drive. But when you look out over this area, it will all look like turf with a couple of these um, things popping through the through the grass. Um, there, we, we are screening that electric, uh, electric panel uh, and service there um, in the, uh, right off of MLK. And we're providing a little bit of screening off Euclid Avenue just to soften the view of that area. Um, there are bollards that are removable that are shown off of MLK and Euclid Avenue. Uh, we're gonna further continue to have the dialogue with the city of to understand the, the requirements if there are any from the city's perspective, but we do want to prevent cars pulling in, vehicles pulling in and out of this site, and then it's only intended to be used by the district. Um, we did attend a design review meeting, and in that meeting, one of the comments we received was providing and you know using the sewer district improvements as an opportunity to educate the public on what was constructed here and why it's important. So we have, um, we thought it was a great idea, Jeffrey and I chatted about it. So we have added an, an educational sign that kind of speaks to the, the improvements that the sewer district's doing to, to help with the flooding in, in UCI. Um, but as you swing around on Euclid Avenue, you can see really the main focus of the project is the Hannah Monument. Um, what we've done here is open up that corner again creating that public space at fronting the street that will draw people in into the to to the statue in the plaza area um, we have amenities at the road uh, such as bench um, benches um, trash receptacle uh, bike racks um, there's a, some UC, uh, UCI has some signage there that we're going to maintain that informational signage and as you enter the space, again, it's all centered around that circle. And that arc sidewalk is, again, reinforcing that old um, right away from the trolley turnaround. Um, but as you enter, we're going to maintain the statue in its current location and the pavers that are around it that are shown in that dark red. And we're going to just clean that up and kind of tuck point and repair as needed. We're also going to blend some new pavers around that a statue to create a plaza area. We're looking to match those pavers with something very similar to what's out there now. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the site furnishings. Again, trying to match the site furnishings that the Olmsted brothers had specified previously in the project and, and continue to kind of match that the, the furnishings that are existing. Uh, the trail uh, on this page is existing. It's asphalt. Uh, travels from uh, north to south along the what on that western edge. The asphalt portion of it, we are going to re rehab. We're going to mill it and, and replace it. The portion as it enters the kind of the plaza space and the statue, we're looking for it to transition to concrete in that area. Um, and that way, it kind of all ties in together and it kind of reinforces that arc. Um, as a note, one of the other comments we received 
in design review was to add benches um, near that open lawn area. You know, that open lawn area is really intended for a future phase. Um, as Jeffrey mentioned, there's funding for what's shown on the plan now, but that open lawn is, is really intended for as right now to function as a flexible space. But at some point there could be future improvements there. And we have added benches along the, the trail um, for seating um, that could be directed to the trail or to the open space. Um, and that was one of the comments from design review and we have addressed it. The, the last comment we received in design review was, was the pedestrian crossings across MLK and Euclid Avenue. And what we did was we just updated this rendering to show that there's existing crosswalks out there now. We just depicted them a little bit better in this, in this uh, concept. So we feel comfortable with, with the crossings that are there. There's signals there already. We're going to, um, anything inside the curbing from really from Chester and Euclid and MLK um, is either going to be new pavement or we're going to replace any pavement that, is, that needs to be replaced. But that um, corner at Chester and Euclid Avenue will it can be completely redone. So those, those ramps will be uh, corrected and uh, meet the city standards, but also repair any, any cracks because it'll all be new, new pavement. Um, there are, there's landscaping in front of the statue to kind of um, provide uh, views to the statue and highlight the statue, and then landscaping on either side of the statue, which will reinforce the, the arc of the old um, trolley turnaround. Jeffrey, is there anything you want to add to this rendering before we go to the furnishings? Uh, no, it, it's all, only that, um, you know, one of the other comments from design review is that uh, they had, um, I, I think the usability of this site is, is been, has been compromised by the, the, the intense kind of traffic that, that encircles it. It's kind of like a Columbus Circle sort of situation. It's a beautiful center anchor, but it's, it, it's kind of difficult to get to. And while it's not in the scope of this project, it was commented on in the in the in the Sasaki study of the larger area that calming traffic and reinforcing the crossings would definitely uh, improve the, the the use of this this particular site. And we've done what we can on our site, I think, to help you know crossings and, and getting across the road, each roadway. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you could get a sense of. Um, <clears throat> The top image is the reinforced paving, uh, the grass pavers or the grid on the sewer district site and how that we intend for that to blend in and still be a public space and open lawn area. Um, you can see the bench. If you go out there to the site now, the same benches are out on the site. It's the, the uh, old World's Fair bench. We're continuing to use the same bench, but possibly be backless in area, so it's it's more flexible in certain situations. And then, you know, complementary bike racks, we're, we're, we need to finalize that, but, you know, those are, that's the intent of, of the bike rack situation as well. If you go to the next slide, um, this image is from the master plan. Uh, it gives you a, a, an idea of what the overall design intent was, uh, that you can see that Hannah statue there in the top, towards the top corner and how it was at that time was intended to reinforce the old trolley right away and how the the uh, other monuments kind of all work together in this intersection and how the, um, the thought was that that monument and that plaza space would really start to engage the public right away and that, and that is all still our intent even though the design has changed slightly and if you go to the next slide it gives you really gets you down into the site and gives you a sense of the the design intent um this is still going to be similar high canopy trees we're trying to save as almost all the trees that are on site now and we'll kind of prune those up and uh, remove any dead limbs so the tree canopy is going to be fabulous um and giving those trees a new breath of life the the the, the monument will stay in that same loco location with that little low garden landscape kind of sitting to the foreground and the pavers around it uh emphasizing this public open space uh, the main difference is you can see there's a seat wall behind the statue. Um, that seat wall will not is not part of this part of the it's not part of the project. You know, due to some funding um, issues and, and trying to get all this pulled together. 
I think that's our last slide. If Jeffrey, you want to add anything or we can open it up to questions. No, I'm good. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, or that presentation, we'd ask for feedback from the local commission or committee. Ms. Scott, please go ahead. Good morning, uh, commissioners. Um, this did go to the Euclid Corridor Design Review Committee. And one thing that I do want to point out is the activity that is taking place to the west of this site. Uh, which many of you may know is the circle square development that encompasses um, a great portion that's directly adjacent from this site. And so um, the developers of that project were made aware of, um, of this uh, proposal and, uh, and the conditions uh, to better integrate the pedestrian um, connection between this, this uh, extension site as well as their development site. And so they've been working very closely with UCI and the city um, to uh, meet um, or enhance, I guess, the conditions that were laid out in um, with the Euclid Corridor Committee's meeting motion and um, their conditional approval. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that feedback and that summary. Sure. We'll move on to others um, from the city here to speak on behalf of the project. Do we have feedback from the councilman on this one, Don? I do not. Uh, he uh, he did receive the agenda, but we we received nothing from him at this point. Okay. Then we will move on to opening the floor for the commission for questions and comments. Ms. Bailey. Ms. Bailey, you are still muted if you are speaking. Thanks. Um, so why the Northeast District was doing their project or maybe doing it, how much of the existing landscape is still in the project? Is the majority of it is still in the play? I mean, on, or is, is this is all new? The, the the large uh, the mature trees that are in good health are all being um, are all being maintained and then there's a, a, a significant amount of additional plantings that are going on between the the bed plantings and some new tree plantings so everything okay. that, everything significant and healthy that is there will remain and then we're adding to that all right you made a comment about vehicle coming on to the site with a paver is off in Martin Luther King right there. So um, they just come in there just to do maintenance work on the uh, equipment below. Is that how that works? That's correct. Okay. Um, also, um, you mentioned about the air vents on the site. How, how many is on there? Yvonne, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, the the site furnishings is that the question? How many we have? Yeah, um, I'd say approximately. They have talk. We have approximately eight benches on site, and then um, there's uh, I believe five bike racks shown. And what color? What color are they? The the bench is shown on the screen is is what's existing out there. It's a wood bench with with black, um, iron you know legs and arms, and then the the bike racks would be something similar to what's shown here to match. Oh, 
Um, no, that's not, I'm sorry about that. I'm still, I'm talking about the equipment that's under the ground. Oh, okay. You mentioned about the air vent that's coming from the equipment. I just want to know how tall that is and will we be able to see it, um, you know, when you're walking on the site and what color it is. You mean, okay. you mean the big, it was mentioned the big, in the, the big, presentation. It, they're, they're the big snorkels, I believe, is what, what a lot of people call them. So there, it's like a curved, a large, tall curve bed, right? Okay. Yeah, I believe so. And the the electrical equipment is going to be left on is also standing, about I'd say probably about six feet tall, but that is also encased in a black ornamental fence. Um, and we do have some landscape around that to to kind of screen that material. And that was that be one of my questions. If you're going to put some landscaping around it. And the color you're saying is black? Yes. Okay. I'm just wondering if it, it can be painted, um, to, you know, to blend in. Because uh, could we go back to that previous um, slide and zoom in to that artwork? Further up, not go past the benches and where the 3D artwork, no. Go back where the benches are. I don't have the ability. No, showing to, them. No, yeah, right there, and just zoom in. I don't have the ability the to zoom in. So can it enlarge so everyone can see it if you can. Miss Bailey, I do not have that ability to zoom in. You oh, okay, that's control. fine. You have that's that control fine. on your. Panel. Is is what we're looking at? Is that also part of the uh, the new the equipment or what? I just. That is just depicting the reinforced uh, drive. Um, there are other aspects of this rendering that were part of the conceptual plan that are not being implemented. That the stone wall that you see in behind the the reinforced drive is not part of the current proposal. Okay, it's not. This, right, all, well, this, is, this is all. This is only. This is only I'm so sorry. This is the only the only intention of this illustration is to show the reinforced lawn. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. But the benches and the furniture, I don't have any uh, problem with that. But I'm just trying to visualize how the equipment is going to blend in. And you answer my question, there is a fence that's high in the um, air vent, that's the, the, um, the goose neck, neck shape, and it's six feet tall. And I'm just wondering, how that's going to blend in with the landscape. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Other questions and comments from the commission? I guess I'll ask mine. I'm just, I'm trying to read your notes on here to, to find it where the gooseneck you know, equipment is and so forth so that I make sure that I'm clear. Could you point it out, Carl? Like where so the all, fence. The, all the equipment is kind of on the uh, between MLK and Euclid Avenue, and that's yeah, right there. Yeah. Where Carl's at that's that's where like that's where the the taller stuff is, and uh, most of it again is is below grade, and it's all installed now. So if you drive by the site, you'll see everything that's going to kind of remain on the site. Okay, that's helpful. Mr. Runges, you had uh, some comments or feedback? Yeah, not to the um, park itself, but you had mentioned about pedestrian safety, and I'll just mention this as someone who, this is my commute here to work. I drive through this intersection every morning. Um, the concerns I think that were relayed about pedestrian safety crossing over MLK are valid. You see here in this area, there are, you can't see it here off screen, but there are four lanes that come into this intersection and the furthest right is a right turn only. However, traffic does sometimes, and I've seen it many, I've seen it go straight through here onto this area that it doesn't, is not supposed to. You know, I think if something is mentioned at UCI, I know my colleague Ms. Scott is here to do more something of a protection in this area so cars are not able to cross over in here 
I know that's outside of your initial scope, but it might be something to relay back uh, for the safety purposes that they were, I think, looking for. Um, it, is, it is not a, I've biked through here as well. This is because the bike lane starts right here and it just starts up here. So this is um, an interesting area to get through either on bike or pedestrian. So I just thought I'd bring that to your attention. Thank you for that feedback, Mr. Brunges. Mr. Pettit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question for Mr. Streen. Is there any is there any need or any plan to do any uh, restoration of the Hannah Monument as part of this project? Good question. Yeah, we're getting an estimate for the the cleaning of it. Um, the museum is responsible for for all of the sculptures in the Fine Arts Garden, and this this being one of them. Um, so it's in good. I believe it was included in the Sculpture Center's restoration about. I don't know, it was like eight years ago or so. So it's in reasonable shape, but we're going to get an estimate to have it uh, cleaned and, and um, resealed, re repatinated and sealed as well and see if we can fit it into the budget of this pro uh, project. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. That's great to know. Um, other questions or comments from the commission? I think this is a very um, creative way to try to incorporate, address a, a, a fact of issues that are occurring within the area, but trying to turn it into an asset for the community um, and really incorporating the arts to reinforce the university circle, um, you know, focus, I think is you know, a wonderful addition to this area. Or to this site, I should say, within this area. <laughs> Other questions or comments from the commission or would someone like to put forward a motion? I want to make a comment and then uh, do a motion. Um, the comment is, um, I would like to have more information shared with staff only for the parents look of how the defense uh, and the, the air vent gooseneck and the um, landscape around how that would look and share that with staff. Cause I'm not getting a visual idea how that would look cause that's on MLK and you can see that there's nothing blocking that like no landscape or tree off of MLK. So I would like that information share with staff. Um, so having the parents just to see how that looks and I'll make that motion. Um, the motion is to approve the um, um, uh, artwork um, presentation as presented with that stipulation that they share the um, the vertical elements uh, of the gooseneck from the equipment with staff so they can see how the final look appears from the Martin Luther King um, view. Thank you for that motion with those conditions. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any further discussion? I, uh, make a comment. The, um, the, the, the infrastructure that is part of the sewer district project is outside of our scope. Um, so that would be something that we'd have to take up with the district. Okay, I understand. Okay. Should we amend the could uh, depict it a little bit better with the fence so that you can see, you know, how even if it's a picture, you know, then with the fence so that we can maybe fill in the blanks. Um, is is that what you're looking for, Miss Bailey? Just to understand, you know, what? Yes, yeah, so at least understand how it looks. Yeah. At least share that information. But it's not part of the um, motion. I could take that out the motion, but at least share that um, with staff so we can see how that looks. Since then, it's not part of their design. It's a separate entity, correct? We only improve in the landscape, but I understand that another party is doing the infrastructure underneath. I thought I heard earlier that you were working together on this. <laughs> so, um, we, we, we would have liked to. Uh, yeah. can. <sighs> Uh, I just want to add, we are working together. 
Um, but their their equipment is you know out of our control. I mean, they have their standard standards for that. Um, I think if we could dictate some of that stuff, um, we would have. But it's out of our control. We're where we're trying to work with is the landscape around it, so we can make it um, soften its appearance on the site from, like you said, MLK, which we agree with, and within the park. So we will do our best to do that. Okay, I, I appreciate that, but I'm not asking you to make any design change to something that's not part of your scope. But at least trying to visualize, block that, you know, appearance of that. So thank you for that. So that's what I want you to share that with staff, and that's part of my motion. The whole presentation is um, I um, approving that as presented, but add that in to share that information with staff on how to make that more blocking it and also more prettier. Thank you. Um, one addition that I would recommend adding, which was just brought to uh, my attention, was that you know, we do need the final materials and landscape plans with the planting plan for uh, final approval. So if you could follow up and submit that to uh, staff, um, I would like to recommend that you add that as a condition to your motion, Ms. Bailey, so that you know, we can you know, get final approval when it's appropriate of the permit. I agree. I'll, I'll add that. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I believe you second it. Do you uh, agree to that additional condition? Yes, I do. I'll second the additional condition. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Clickia. Mr. Clickia, are you still with us? Um, Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank you. We look forward to seeing your project progress. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We'll move on to our fifth applicant located at 2087 Fairview Avenue, the conversion to a single family house, um, front porch and patio uh, oh. revision, I'm sorry, renovations, rooftop deck and penthouse landscaping and windows. Hi, good morning. This is Gary Neola. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Landmarks Commission. Uh, so it's listed as conversion of a single family, but it's always been a single family home. So I just wanted to clarify that to start with. Uh, so it may have been at some point rented out, but um, but it's a, it's a single family. It's been zoned single family from its origins. So anyhow, moving on, uh, the slide you see there shows the location. Uh, along Fairview where this property is. Um, so uh, if we could go to the next slide, we can show you some site dimensions just to get a sense as to you know, how big this property is, the parcel that we're working on. Uh, it's 35 feet wide by 102 feet at its furthest uh, depth. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So on this slide, uh, in the lower left hand corner, I've got markers to show where the various photographs are along the street. Um, so you can see what the adjacent homes look like. Uh, and then when you, uh, the, that's the house to the left is the upper left hand um, home. And then to the uh, second photo, you can see the side of the our project, but behind that is um, another home that's, that's set back from there. And then uh, the third photo, shows uh, uh, the house to the right, but also the project we're working on where we're gonna renovate this, this single family home. Uh, and then uh, if you look at four, five, and six, those are the views across the street from um, this, this particular residence. 
can go to the next slide, please. So um, some more views just showing a little bit closer. We, we're going to be um, removing that the front porch that has the fence on it that's right up to the sidewalk and reworking that. So that's a big part of what we're doing. Uh, we're trying to re return this home to what was uh, what it was like originally built. So that's that's a big part of this project. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So this shows in plan that we are uh, on the left with the area of the porch will be demolished. Uh, it's porch or patio, whatever you want to call it. And then to the, the right side of the screen, the proposed is to, uh, we will build um, new steps from the sidewalk up with some uh, low retaining walls to uh, get us to new steps that'll go up to the to the front porch. There's existing flowers uh, flower bed on the uh, along the uh, the left side of the the home there that are going to remain. There's uh, so there's really no change to that. Uh, anyway, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows the uh, existing floor plan and. Uh, so, just gives you a sense as to what we're doing there. This is the, how we're changing it. We're uh, real. We're um, yeah, just a, a plan view. But what it shows here is that we're adding some some windows on on the, um, the along the left side, the left side elevation, to bring some more light into the living area and have visibility to the green space adjacent to this property. Um, and then um, we're relocating the. <clears throat> the, the front door to where it was originally and uh, putting windows in where they were originally uh, along the front on the first and uh, first floor. Um, next slide, please. So um, this gives you uh, the front elevation of what we're doing. Um, we're uh, uh, we're going to uh, match the existing brick. That's there. We've got a mason that, that um, we're real confident they can um, do some excellent masonry work here to to make this um, look like it was part of the original, like it was back when it was built. Um, and then you you have uh, some new new plantings in front of the the first floor porch. Uh, moving up onto the porch, you can see the stone lintels that are above. Uh, each of the windows and the door, same thing on the second floor. And that was the original, those are in the original location. I mean, that's how we know where things were going back. We don't have photographs of the house from when it was originally built, but uh, just field observation, we can tell where where things were. So we that um, gives us the opportunity to, to come back to, to the original. And um, so when we move up to the, the second floor, Floor, um, we're using uh, some stylish uh, columns uh, with <clears throat> uh, like a Doric theme to it. Uh, but most of uh, most of this is using um, this, the detailing to that we would imagine was would have been there from the very beginning, uh, and, and plus adding in the the, uh, the railings at, at both elevations, the first and second floor. Moving to the uh, next slide, please. So this is the uh, side where the driveway goes along. There's windows that were infilled previously. Um, we're not going to open those up because of just the noise and the adjacency to the next door neighbor. However, the two windows that you do see, the the one on the uh, the lower level is where you come in off of the back uh, entrance and you come up to a landing. Uh, so that that brings some light in there, and then the second floor is the top of the stair um, at the second elevate second level. Um, you also see the side elevation of a uh, on the right hand side at the rear. We're adding a uh, covered entrance for the because there's a door back there. If we go to the next slide, please, you can see the that there's that's where the door is. We're we're adding a, 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 a covered entrance that mimics the architecture of the, the front uh, porch with the, the kind of the hip roof piece to it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this side here 
uh, we've added some windows like, uh, and uh, we're trying to open this up to the uh, again to the to the green space that's adjacent um, to this property uh, brings light in and uh, uh, just gives you some nice views. Uh, next slide, please. So these are there's a view as if you're walking down the street uh, heading um, towards the house. You'll you'll see what you know what that looks like. Again, you got your existing plantings along the the side of the house with the existing uh, like railroad tie uh, planter box there. And you can see the uh, where we have the uh, low retaining walls along the sidewalk that turn back to, to hold the earth so we can have the, the planted area there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this would be a view from across the street. Kind of the same, you can see the same thing, but this is what it it it'll appear as you're walking down the street. Next slide, please. This is uh, when you're flying over. If you have a helicopter. Next slide, please. This is a view from the neighbor's uh, home. That's uh, the house that's set back from the street. Uh, so just they, that's what they're going to see. Next slide. Uh, yeah, that's the, just what it's like looking at the side again. I'm sorry. If you can go to the next slide. And this is as you're walking the opposite direction coming up the street, you can see along the driveway what this when we put in the retaining wall uh, coming out to the street there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from across the street. Next slide, please. And a straight on view. And these are some of the materials we're we're looking at for the door. It'll be a thermatrue door that um, has uh, it'll be white, not gray. Uh, the brick again, we're going to use to match the existing. Uh, we're using Pella Reserve uh, windows, which are for historic purposes. We want to use those double hungs and uh, and also uh, asphalt shingles. It'll be the black sable over the um, the, the second floor. Uh, porch roof and the rear roof over the front that entrance there at the rear. And we're going to use uh, for trim. We're going to use the borel uh, material because it works really well being um, worked very similar to wood. Uh, it, it lasts uh, well due to weather. Um, you know, so we, we feel comfortable with that. Uh, if um, that's what we're considering. We may end up using wood, but um, that would be ideally what we'd want to use. So uh, I think that's the last slide. Uh, so if I could open it up to any questions or comments. Excellent. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we will begin with feedback from the local committee. Good morning. This is Ray Christosik. Uh, we reviewed the project a couple times. We looked at it conceptually two weeks ago, and uh, we asked them to make some changes. And we looked at it on Tuesday, and we thought those changes, um, one was the rooftop that they decided not to include. Um, so we unanimously approved it, and I'd like to applaud the owner for, you know, Restoring this house, um, removing that bulky patio in the front, and um, and it's going to it's going to return to an owner uh, owner occupant uh, from a rental property. So these are the th these are the, the things we want to see happen in Little Italy. So we 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 unanimously approved approved this project. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, we will now open up the floor for questions and comments from the commission. Questions or comments from the commission, Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> My only question is right on this elevation, the, um, the height of that handrail. Does that mimic, does that height mimic what they found as the um, original height? 
or uh, well, what what is the height of that handrail uh, relative to the original? Yeah, no, that's a that's that's a good question. So the the height is shown at forty two inches. Uh, the building code doesn't require forty two; it requires thirty six. So we're actually going to um, work with that. We don't know what was there originally, so uh, but thirty six would be would bring the the height of it down a little bit below the trim line there on the uh, as you go up the base of the column there. So yeah, um, so we're going to have a thirty six inch high railing, which will meet building code, and I think it works well proportionally. Right, I agree, and. Uh... Oftentimes we would advocate even for a 30 inch high handrail. If it's yeah, the building code won't give us that opportunity. We have the ability to override that. Is that right? Okay. Good to know. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Other questions or comments from the commission? I will go next and then uh, turn over to Ms. Anderson. You know, I agree with the comments that were made. I applaud you for, or that Ray made that I applaud you for converting this back to, you know, its original use and you know, from a rental to a um, owner occupied. And, you know, besides the handrail that Mr. Strickland just brought up, I think, you know, it's a, a great conversion. Um, but I would support a lower handrail um, between, you know, uh, or the, the 28 to 36 inch height, you know, depending on what is appropriate for this style building um, versus the 42 inch. We will do that. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a wonderful project, a great addition to the neighborhood. I support the lower handrail. Uh, I am just wondering what the material of the handrail is. It's going to be the borel material or wood. Um, we haven't decided yet, but it's it's not going to be vinyl by any stretch. It's not going to be. It's going to look authentic. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was my concern. Thank you so much. Sure. Other questions or comments from the commission. Other questions or comments from the commission or someone like to make a motion? Make a motion. Approve the um, certificate as presented with the um, statement to lower the um, hang rent for 42 inches. I'm not giving a number, but share that information with staff along with the material, your final uh, material color of the um, the material of the railing, the boral or the wood. Okay, it's wood. Yeah, but you just mentioned that that you didn't have a particular product or something earlier. This well, we we're we're considering using boral, which is a fly ash material. It's 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 something that's you know comes from a sustainable. It, it's a sustainable material, and that's. I see it right there. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So we would yeah, like to use it. that. Um, if it turns out budget wise, it's not going to work. We're going to use. Okay. We're going to use the wood, and uh, it'll be painted. We would like to use the borel because you can. Again, it it lasts really well. Um, getting wet, soaked. You could soak it for, you know, forever in water, just about, and it would do just fine. It's it's one of those. It, it it just works really well in, in, in the weather and especially in Northeast Ohio. So, uh, yeah, so it's either going to be borel or it'll be wood that gets painted. We'd like the borel so it doesn't need the maintenance as much. Well, whatever your, whatever your decision is, share it with staff. That's right. Wood or wood. Um, so that's the, the motion and lower the height and share the height, um, final height with staff. And the final uh, material, wood or board. That's the motion. Okay, so the motions with the condition to um, review and lower the handrail height and submit the final material and color to staff for the handrail. I'll second that motion. Thank you. And a second. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. 
Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. We really appreciate taking time to review this and we look forward to getting it executed. Excellent. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Take care. You too. That concludes our certificates of appropriateness. We'll move on to National Register of Historic Places nominations. Uh, I'd like to ask staff to uh, tell us about the project located at 9990 Euclid Avenue, the uh, Euclid Avenue Christian Church, East Mount Zion Baptist Church. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As a certified local government, we have the ability to comment on uh, National Register nominations. Uh, in this case, it's it's going to the uh, Ohio Historic Sites Preservation Advisory Board on December 3rd. Uh, I also think this one is particularly worthy of comment. I think it's a really important project. Uh, the building is a Cleveland landmark. Uh, it's recently had some uh, concerns and issues uh, and and I think getting this listed will be a, a huge uh, uh, and and worthy uh, achievement. And uh, Margaret Land, who prepared the nomination, is here from the Cleveland Restoration Society to talk about the nomination, the history of the building, as well as some of the other uh, projects that are going on with the church. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Lan. If you'd like to tell us about the project, we would love to hear about it. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair and members of the commission. We are very excited about all of the work that has been recently happening at East Mount Zion. Um, so the church was very interested in obtaining the National Register designation as part of their renewed commitment to uh, full restoration of the church and finding use for the church, not only for their congregation and ministry services, but also um, as a potential partner in the community. So the nomination will be listed under um, the criterion for architecture, recognizing that it is um, an extant Akron Plan Church designed by architect George Kramer, who is known nationally for um, church design, especially utilizing the Akron Plan. And this is the only structure we know of in the Cleveland area by that architect. Um, it is clad in the green serpentine stone, um, setting it apart again from other Romanesque revival churches in the area. Uh, the nomination will also be part of the Ohio uh, uh, SHPO's multiple property designation for African American um, sites throughout the state. Because when East, since East Mount Zion obtained the church in 1955 and demonstrated a lot of activity in the civil rights era through 1976, um, the property is eligible to be listed as part of that multiple property documentation. So that will be under um, ethnic and cultural heritage listing as well. So our period of significance ranges all the way um, from 1908 when the structure was constructed through 1976. I don't know if there's any other questions about the, the nomination itself. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, we will move open up the floor then for the commission for questions and comments.
I guess I'll start us off. I think this is a spectacular building. I think it's very worthy of continuing the nomination or, you know, uh, in this process and I uh, feel it's a, a great, you know, um, opportunity to be included in you know, that application. Questions or comments uh, from the commission? Mr. Brunges. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we had done a lot of research on this building because it was threatened at one point uh, with demolition. And the, the green serpentine stone was is a rare thing here in the state of Ohio. And actually it's getting more rare, um, even in Pennsylvania where it was mined. And it comes from a historic um, mine that was actually part, it was in the middle of the troop movements during the American Revolution. And this, the, the stone came later after it had been closed and they reopened it. And through research, I think I've only been able to identify five buildings that were ever built in the state of Ohio with this material, uh, and only three remain. Um, one is in Columbus, I think it's the Broad Street Church, and I'm probably going to blank on the other one. Uh, oh, no, uh, East Liverpool. East Liverpool. Has, has, yeah. has the church, and then the two that have been demolished, one was in uh, Mansfield, and the other one was in Dayton. Uh, there was a mention of a sixth one that was a house, but that was supposed to be here in Cleveland as well, but have not been able to find any documentation on that sixth building. So this is one of three remaining with this material as its exterior. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. That's what's always caught my eye about this one. And I uh, remember that. Ms. Anderson, questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, there was, I know there was some discussion, I think last year, um, about possible demolition of the building, as you mentioned. And I went over to just to walk around the outside. It's, it's an amazing place. Um, I was concerned though, because the exterior uh, siding is showing some, uh, some uh, signs of, um, Spalding, uh, material spalding uh, has some deterioration and the roof, uh, you can even see in some of the photos, there there we go, um, that the roof is old and needs to be replaced. So my question is, with this designation uh, and listing, would the uh, owners be able to avail themselves of some funding uh, to uh, address some of these exterior issues, which are urgent. I think these things need to be taken care of sooner than later. Yes, yeah. um, the hope is that this will open up some doors. For example, the Partners for Sacred Places, a national trust uh, grant, that this will open some doors for that funding. They have secured some grant funding to do emergency roof repair and that is actively being done now. Um, they've also done some emergency stabilization repair to the stone. We did receive um, with partnership through the city and the landmark commission office, we have received a certified local government grant to do a full study of the serpentine stone and that actually will start in two weeks. Um, there is a high chance that this, the building will need refaced down the road. Um, serpentine stone was never a good choice, unfortunately, for exterior um, building material, especially in our climate. And this is something a lot of properties, especially in Pennsylvania, where the stone comes from, these properties have been facing this. Um, the Broad Street Church that Carl mentioned has been totally refaced with a synthetic product. Um, other uh, buildings in the Pennsylvania area, we've seen a combination of patching products or refacing options, either natural stone or a synthetic product. So this facade study that's going to kick off here in a couple weeks will hopefully provide the church 
with several options of what to do about the serpentine spalling and several cost estimates related to that project because that's obviously if they're launching a capital campaign um, that's going to be a huge part of that fundraising and they need to know what they're the, what's the roadmap for repair and how much it's going to cost so they're trying to um, be very conscious in those steps forward addressing the emergency repairs as soon as possible but really coming up with a complete conditions assessment to inform them about how to do a full restoration Any other questions, Ms. Anderson? And yes, I thank you so much. I, I this is kind of a difficult problem, but it's it's such a, a beautiful, uh, important church. It's definitely worth the uh, time and investment. Thank you. We found there are a number of interior artistic elements here as well that are so worth keeping. Um, all of the pews the panels that make up the movable partitions for the plan were original and then the church um, is all of the windows are lamb studio stained glass and i mean every window throughout the building except for the basement it's the only church in cleveland that has this amount of lamb studio stained glass there's um a couple when one at plymouth um, and a couple windows in storage with Whitney stained glass uh, that have come out of other buildings that have come down. And so I think there are so many artistic elements here that it's really important that the church take this comprehensive look at how to, how to maintain what it has, but do the full restoration because it's so there's just so much here worth keeping. Agree. It's beautiful. Ms. Bailey, questions or comments? No, I just want to make a comment, um, commending moving forward with making this a national historic register of, of this beautiful building. Um, and I'm glad to hear that there's some work is being done right now um, to this building. So that's my comment. Just glad to hear that it's moving forward to the next level to get more um, recognition on the building. Thank you. So Ms. Bailey, did you make a motion part of that or you're saying you will? Oh, oh no, I haven't made a motion. Ready. I was just making a comment. Oh, okay. But okay. I can't make one if you're ready. <laughs> well, your recommendation to, for you know, that statement, I just wanted to, to make sure I wasn't um, overstepping something. Um, well, let's see if there's any other questions or comments. If not, I will take that motion. Um, okay. Now, just want I want to make sure I'm making this motion right. Um, the motion is to recommend um, put this project, the building, toward the National Historic Registration. That's my motion. So your motion, as a recommendation. Uh, to nominate, recommendation to okay. nominate this for the National Register. Okay, the nomination, oh, okay. To nominate this building as for the recommendation. All right, thank you. Thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. So we have a, a motion, a second, any further discussion? No? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Bonesi? Yes. Mr. Santora? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Mr. Strickland leave. had mentioned he had to leave at 11.30. Yes. Thank you, I forgot that. Uh, Mr. Tarasic? Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. 
Excellent. We look forward to this you know, wonderful building continuing on in the process. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that in, uh, concludes our National Register nominations um, administrative reports. Do we have any today? Uh, I just have a couple things. Uh, it's United Way time again, and I I'm still have to figure out how we're going to do that this year. It's it's uh, it's an online process, but I will get the forms to the commission as soon as I can if if anyone's interested in contributing. Uh, we have four more meetings in 2021. Uh, one of which is an in-person meeting regarding the, uh, the final approval for the Sherwin Williams project. Uh, and I will be getting you out the 2020 2022 meeting schedule very shortly. Uh, wanted the commission to know that city council has given you all a raise. Uh, we're <laughs> it's actually for all the boards and commissions. It's still not clear if it's a, if it's if it's an immediate raise or if it's when your terms are renewed, but we will clarify that and let you know. But uh, congratulations on that. Um, we have several projects coming up in the near future that are going to require site visits, and we'll get back to you about those and getting those scheduled. And I think that's all I have at the moment. Excellent. Um, I think you already sent us the schedule too. I think you sent okay. that like two weeks ago. Um, I believe did others okay. remember that receiving that also, I have to, I believe I filed it. So I'd have to go into my file. To... I can't remember myself. So if, if I ha haven't, I will send it. And if I have, I won't. Okay. I have not seen that yet in my email, so another email doesn't hurt, I guess. Maybe I just received it. <laughs> so, why don't you you're send special. It <laughs> as, as far as I know, we're still virtual for the near future, but we, we have booked room 514 uh, for, the, for the entire year if, if things change. Excellent. Mr. Brunges, you had some comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there seemed to be some confusion this morning about people having received the invitation for the meeting. Uh, I sent both October meeting minutes on the same day back earlier, since now I am in charge of uh, creating those minutes so we don't have to worry about switching hosts and confusion that way. It is going to be my, I want to get these done earlier than later. So I'm probably going to be sending out the next three meetings all very close together, just to put them on the schedule. So you can at least put them as a holder on your schedule. So be prepared for that, that you'll get them probably boom, boom, boom. I'm going to try and send out the first quarter of meetings, or I'll try and send the meetings out a quarter at a time in the new year, just so that it is scheduled and ready to go. Just be prepared to see them because I know that's a change from how we've been doing it. So I understand why there was confusion this time. It's just I like to get things done ahead of time so I don't have to worry about it later. And then I just have because everybody who gets invited to all these meetings is the same. <laughs> And it just changes who the participants are, then I can update that as that gets closer. So that's how you how I'm, how I'm handling that. Because you put a unique um, access code for each invite, correct? Each meeting will have its own invite code, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks for that update. And, you know, a um, reminder to look for our invites because I know. Uh, it did come through last time. I remember clicking, you know, confirm to both of them. So it just hits your schedule a little bit quicker. So I think I personally appreciate you sending out the invites earlier so that we make sure the right, you know, hold is on each day. Any other uh, feedback, questions, comments from anyone else on the commission? No? 
All right, well then we are adjourned. Thank you for uh, an easy meeting uh, agenda there, Don and Carl. Um, <laughs> I think that was one of our quicker meetings with having six things on there and having multiple you know, things to focus on. So um, yeah, and every, I hope everyone has a great week and we will see you in two weeks. Sounds All right, good. take Thanks. care. Bye everyone, have a good one. See you, everyone. Bye,